Today's program, Ohio Gets in the Game. Ohio is sponsored by E.P. Ferris, uh, represented today by Matt Ferris, if he's around, please stand, <laughs> and also by the uh, Smoot Construction, represented today by both senior and junior, Lewis Smoot. Our first panelist, and welcome to town, is Amit Patel, the general manager of Hollywood Casino Columbus. Uh, Amit has over 20 years experience in the gaming industry and has been with Penn National, the operator of the Columbus Casino since 2001. Please welcome Amit. Come on up. A familiar person to all of us, our next panelist is Joanne Davidson chair of the Casino Control Commission. She's been having fun over the last several months. With, with this appointment by Governor Kasich, Joanne brings over 20 years experience in the state legislature, including six years as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Speaker Davidson, please come on up. And I'm pleased to introduce Bill Cohen, our moderator this afternoon. Bill reports for Ohio Public Radio and TV stations covering many public policy issues, including casino legislation. Bill, here's your panel. Well, over a 19-year over a span, beginning in 1990, uh, backers of legalized gambling casinos uh, failed four different times to convince Ohio voters to authorize it. And then in 2009, Ohioans finally said yes to a constitutional amendment that casino developers had proposed. And that's why four new casinos are now being constructed, one each in Toledo, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and here in Columbus. Today we're here to talk about the new Columbus Casino out on the west side. Um, the big questions now are not should Ohio have casinos. The voters already decided that, 53% saying yes. So instead, the, the questions are how will they be regulated? Uh, what are the rules? Who's going to get all the jobs? What will cities and schools do with the uh, tax revenue that the casinos will pay? I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions to pose. Uh, we'll have Mr. Patel and Ms. Davidson give us a few general comments to start off, and then I'll pose a few questions, and we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, let's hear first from Mr. Patel. Could you just give us an update, uh, two or three minutes here? Where are we at uh, in terms of that uh, Columbus Casino? Sure. Um, you can, I think you can just kay. stay right there. Is that, is that Great. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thanks again to the Metropolitan Club for uh, providing us this opportunity to update uh, the Central Ohio community about the progress we're making on the west side. Um, first and foremost, for those of you who haven't been to the west side lately, I can only say that the changes that we have made uh, over at our site, at the corner of Georgesville and Broad Street, are simply dramatic. And when I say dramatic, there are some significant milestones that we've reached. Uh, first and foremost, being that we broke ground in April of last year, and in one fell swoop, nine months of relentless work by our friends, community coming together, and getting to a point where by the end of December, the building came totally under roof, and now the interior work has begun uh, uninterrupted by weather conditions. Uh, we are looking very, very good in the process of getting our casino open in the early part of fourth quarter, sometime prior to Thanksgiving. Special thanks uh, to Smoot, first and foremost. Uh, they have been very good partners here with us. Special thanks to the subcontractors that we have connected with as a group, and many special thanks to our friends at the building trades unions as well. Without these three parties, multiple entities coming together, we could not have achieved this milestone back in December. Since then, what we've done is starting to develop a blueprint 
of what the hiring process will look like, when the construction will end, when the permanent jobs will begin. And we made a significant announcement uh, this morning with a consortium that we found with all of the local colleges, primarily the four that we've announced, uh, with an institution of workforce development with us today. Uh, that is Columbus State, Honduras College, and Central Ohio Technical College, who are going to partner with us in not only developing, training, recruiting 2,000 permanent positions as we get late into this year to open the facility. Once we open, uh, our investment will exceed over 400 million in Columbus, and we would have, by then, will have employed over 3,500 construction people, followed by 2,000 permanent people working at the site. And when we open the doors in fourth quarter of this year, in the very first year, we expect to have an average of over 10,000 visitors coming to the west side. Our commitment to the west side has been relentless, will continue to be relentless, and we have partnered with each one of these colleges today to make sure that we provide a preference to all of the potential applicants that come from the west side so that we can prioritize the application pool. As you know from all the headlines that you heard in Cleveland, in Toledo, for every position, we've had a ratio of anywhere from 20 to 30 applicants applying for these roles. West side particularly is our bias because that community, we feel, has been hit the hardest of all the surrounding communities in Central Ohio. Hence, we'll continue that commitment in our charitable efforts, we'll continue our commitment in uh, employment, training, development, and we continue to work with local social services group, business groups, and residents to make Westside a better place. Okay. Uh, with that, last thing, I do want to make sure I thank uh, the Casino Control Commission for, and I'm not trying to earn brownie points here. <laughs> they have been absolutely marvelous to work with. It just seems like since I landed here in August, uh, that we've been growing together, we've been hiring together. As they, Sometimes I feel I'm in contest with uh, Madam Chair here. When she hires five people, I get motivated to hire five more people. <laughs> uh, and so the, the unique part about this process that I've found is this Casino Control Commission has been by far one of the best that I've worked with in my 20-year gaming career, primarily from the fact that in a very short time they've showed me how they can bring best practices from all over the country in different gaming jurisdictions and bring the best ideas, be willing to sit down with us, talk to us, listen to us, and come up with the best policy together so that we have the best foot forward when we open the doors. That Joanne, mm -hmm. Joanne Davidson, maybe you could remind us, just bring us up to date, where are we at in terms of regulating uh, not just this casino, but all of them, uh, but especially on this one, where are we at in terms of issuing the license, doing the background checks, and coming up with all the rules that will, that will regulate this casino? Well, thank you, Bill, and, and thanks everybody for being interested enough to be here today. Um, first, I just want to say what a pleasure it's been to work with and get to know Amit Patel. I notice your wife is here today, and I haven't had a chance to meet her today, but there are new residents in Franklin County, and he's just been very good to work with. I know both operators have some um, representation in the audience today. We are the regulatory body. We understand, and, and I'm sure that we have uh, that understanding goes with both of the operators, what our responsibilities are, and we take those responsibilities very seriously. Uh, as, a, as an individual, I've never been a casino supporter. Uh, those of you that know me in the legislature know that, um, that, that I certainly wasn't supportive of doing anything there. But the people of Ohio, the voters of Ohio have spoken. We understand the responsibility. And what we're charged with is regulating them so that the state of Ohio gets the revenue that is due to them under this agreement and our various township and city and, and school districts get that revenue. And the people who go there have a good time, and they know that these games are being operated appropriately and legally. 
So that's what our challenge is, and we've been working on that. Actually, the commission was appointed a little less than 11 months ago. So we have um, actually not been in existence for any length of time. You may remember some of you that uh, perhaps I overspoke one day, but it was the truth that, that we are a commission that has no money, we have no office, and we have no employees. Well, let me just say to you that we've solved uh, particularly most of those problems. And I do want to mention that because it is, I, I cannot report where we are, Bill, without basically saying that we have moved ahead. We now have the huge number of 16 employees, and I think a few of them are here today, our executive director, Matt Schuler, and our uh, Assistant Executive Director John Barron, I think, are in the audience. I give them a lot of credit for actually recruiting and starting good staff. But I also want to pay a special um, word of appreciation to the Attorney General's Office of Ohio, who staffed us initially and helped us to get where we are today. Because we do not have every one of our rules done yet. But if you'd look, uh, we probably have about close to 200 rules that have been approved by the commission that are going through their official approval process through JCAR. Many of them are already finalized. The, the operators cannot move ahead unless these rules are in place. And so we tried to deal with the initial rules dealing with licensing first. So we were able to put a license out for the operators or an application for a license for the operators on August the 1st. Uh, I think they filed their applications um, to, to the most part. Uh, in late September, and we are right now working through the investigatory process, which is a very detailed process in Ohio law that we have to determine that there is suitability on behalf of not just the operators, but their key employees and their holding companies and everyone else that is associated with them. We have to do the same thing with the gaming vendors, those individuals that are going to provide the slots, that are going to provide the cards. And I was kidding Bill about his tie today with the dice on him. And I said, I think I can tell you just how far in each one of those dots has to be drilled so that you can pass the regulation in Ohio. So we regulate the people that sell this equipment to be sure it's equipment that is acceptable to be used in the casinos here. That's how detailed these regulations are. We still have a few more to do. We'll be meeting next week. We hope to clean um, many of those up then, but I think we are working just hand in glove with the operators, basically saying, what do you need to continue to make progress? What can we work with you to do that? And we are going to be a little delayed on the, the first two openings. I think that both of the operators sort of had a date that they would have liked to open on, but essentially they're not going to be able to open until the commission and the operators agree that we are ready to move in that direction and everything is in order to do that. So we're hoping that we can cut down a little bit on that delayed process, but I do know, and I want to speak for all of the, the commission members, we are not going to move ahead until we think that we have complied with the provisions of Ohio law and we are actually licensing operators that meet the suitability test in the state of Ohio. But um, we're working hard to do that, so that's kind of our update right now, Bill. Mr. Patel, how will your casino deal with customers who are addicted to gambling? Is it possible for the casino to refuse service to them? Can you, can you spot a gambling addict when they come in? How does it work? Absolutely. There's multitudes of avenues that we can provide here from both sides. Uh, and we believe, Bill, that this is not just a uh, regulatory responsibility. From the operator side, we clearly have a responsibility to make sure that anything that we provide in entertainment does not have uh, a, a possible avenue where people go undetected when they get into an addictive behavior. An addictive behavior could be uh, in the form of uh, more shopping, extra spending, gambling, uh, drinking. We have very specific mechanisms on all of these fronts when people enter into the casino. As we start looking at people who are, say, for example, losing at table games, we look at their betting pattern, we look at their spending patterns, we look at the volatility of people spending at the casino, we look at very specifically the alcohol consumption policy, which is least understood uh, by community at large. We would have zero tolerance policy when it comes to over-serving alcohol uh, at any one of our facilities uh, within the venue, uh, especially when people are looking for help. We want to make sure we not only provide them the information, we have an 800 hotline number that we'll be providing. We'll be working with those individuals privately and with their families if needed to make sure that we get them on a path 
we would have a voluntary exclusion program and an involuntary exclusion program that we'll be working with the Casino Control Commission to make sure that those individuals who truly need help, uh, we are there to assist uh, in that process. Now, do I understand correctly, 2% of the gambling revenues are supposed to be set aside for gambling addiction treatment? Something that's, like that's that? That's correct. Of the 2% uh, of, the, of the tax which uh, has been agreed upon, which is a 33% tax on gross revenues of the casinos, is set aside for the for use in treating problem gaming and other addiction services and the commission has taken that responsibility very very seriously and currently uh, working with the commission staff Laura Clemens is here today and she is leading that within the commission staff we are working with um, the Ohio Department of Drug and Alcohol and Addiction Services and also with the Ohio Lottery uh, we're putting actually out a baseline poll so we can determine before the casino is open what the situation is in Ohio. We are also going to do then actually an addition, additional survey of what services are currently available so that as this money begins to become available, it can be targeted in the right way to have the most impact upon the problem gaming. It is something that both the operators are concerned about and they are required to provide us with a plan of what they're going to do internally. We will cooperate with each other in the voluntary and involuntary um, programs that we will have for people to be admitted into the casino, but we will try to work to direct those dollars where they can be the most helpful in Ohio, and it will greatly expand the dollars that are available for this particular you know, uh, treatment services bill. Just one more question on this front, and we'll move on to something else. Uh, you've got gambling addicts, uh, but then there's a, another group of people who may not be addicts, but they still may be uh, people who are losing their rent money, their food money, their college education fund, and losing it at the casinos. Is there any way to deal with them, or since they're not officially addicts, you can't? Bill, that's where my first um, statement comes into the picture here. We don't necessarily look speci specifically for the addictive behavior. Uh, when it comes to spending pattern at a slot machine or table games, that pattern is very important. We monitor it, we analyze it, we do sensitivity analysis on it, and we look at how much people are spending. And if we see any type of volatility, unusual betting patterns, all those things go into our formula of equation of how to detect people who might be going beyond their means. Uh, as you know, this is never a science, but it's full faith effort from all angles to make sure we start developing these patterns on a very scientific basis that we look at on a day to day and, and make sure that as we see these signs, we are able to talk to these individuals directly. I definitely want to make the point of adding uh, what Madam Chair said earlier about the 2% dedicated fund to this issue. This is where I feel Ohio gets it right. I haven't found a state that has designated this type of resources, including in the destination markets, where at the end of the day, or at the end of the first year of operation, 10 to $12 million would be designated for all addictive type behavior problems and to address them and working with the Casino Control Commission is absolutely unprecedented. Could you talk some about the economic development, uh, not in the casino itself, but around it? I think there was a report recently uh, from a business group that uh, was foreseeing uh, dozens, hundreds of hotel rooms, uh, jobs from small business around there. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, time and time again, in every jurisdiction that we've expanded to, uh, what we have found in short term and long term, that casino in itself uh, becomes the jump start for a community. Casino itself, the investment itself, the jobs, the suppliers, the spend, they become the catalyst for growth. What you very quickly see, and you'll start seeing that from next year, uh, f starting with small businesses on the west side to large scale suppliers on west side, all of these institutions, residents, and private businesses, public entities, will start not only reaping benefits, but they in turn will start this propelling cycle where they start beautifying the streets, gas stations, retail conveniences, uh, big names, brand names, national brand names being attracted by three million people visiting this area. All that becomes 
a self-propelling engine. And what we've also seen, and I've said this publicly in our vendor forums, that nobody here should be surprised in what I could say that we create somewhat of an Oprah Winfrey effect on small businesses around the west side because of the sheer volumes that we'll be bringing to the area that has been deprived of for many years. The casino, I understand, will be open 24 hours a day. Can you talk, uh, Ms. Davidson, can you talk a little bit about some of the other rules that, that you've come up with so far? Uh, is it 21? You have to be 21 to go? You have to be 21 years of age. Uh, there is an exception for somebody who is employed uh, that's under that the age to actually be passing through in a service capacity, but other than that, you have to be 21 years of age actually to be um, on the casino floor. Um, and the 24-7, obviously, is, is, is they are permitted to do that under the constitutional amendment, and I think it, my understanding is they do intend to do that. They will still have to meet with the same rules that everybody else does on the service of alcohol, not permitted to serve alcohol on a 24-7 basis. There is a restriction on that. There is a gap in a period of time in which they cannot offer alcohol services. So um, some of those things are actually just compete complying with what is existing Ohio law that has not been changed. Um, and uh, even though I'm, I'm not sure that the, that the casino operators have, have made an attempt to change that, but it has not been changed yet. I, and, and all of the regulations, frankly, they have, one of the th things that I'm gonna go back to the uh, problem gaming issue for just a little bit. They, they are required to join with us, let us approve their materials that will be posted, will be available in the casino for individuals that want to seek help. And, and we are actually working right now with the lottery to do an Ohio-based hotline number that will connect people with the kind of services or information that they need. So a lot of this is jointly with the commission, but we regulate just about everything that they do. Um, we don't regulate what kind of food you have to serve, though, and I think they'll do a very good job. I understand you uh, just entered into the agreement with Columbus State to do your culinary training for your employees, and I think that's great. But as far as everything else, the material that they use, um, everything else that, you know, on the floor, we pretty much prescribe what they have to do. So right now, one of the things we're doing, Bill, to try to make up lost time, is we're trying to basically say, okay, we have to work on a parallel schedule. We, we have to know what you need to be done, we have to know what we can get done, and we have to be sure that we try to make it possible for you to do on the schedule, and you make it possible for us to then do the kind of testing and checking that we have to do. We are far enough along now with these two casinos in Toledo and Cleveland that that becomes fundamental for us to actually be able to set an opening date um, for them. And I think by the time Columbus comes on board, we'll have most of that already worked out of me, so you'll, be, you'll, you'll get a little advantage of that. Sounds but, music to my ears. But you're, yeah. you, <laughs> you're certainly leading the way in developing a unique utilization of, of both private and public educational resources in this state. And so I'm really, I wanna congratulate you on your, you. your press conference this morning. I'm gonna pose one more question, then we'll open it up to audience questions. So uh, get ready to step to the microphone in a couple minutes and uh, ask your question. Uh, the owner of the Cleveland and Cincinnati casinos report today that 41% of uh, their construction contracts so far have gone to companies owned by minorities and women. Uh, talk about uh, how, does, how does the Columbus Casino stack up? Uh, Columbus Casino stacks up extremely well. Uh, in the very early stages, we're not even halfway through uh, the game here. We have awarded, outside of our smooth contract, $190 million in contracts so far. This is, again, public information that we've supplied to Casino Control Commission. And of those 190 million contracts awarded, we range anywhere from 33 to 35% uh, of those contracts being awarded to MB and WB based businesses. This is just specifically for the casino in Columbus. Okay. Let me give you this disclaimer first before we, uh, we go to the <laughs> audience questions. Uh, the Metropolitan Club always leaves time for questions from the audience. You should be aware though that the CMC records all its forms for a televised broadcast on Ohio News Network, uh, streaming on CMC's website and the Columbus Metropolitan Library website. So if you have a question, please step up uh, to the microphone, uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. 
We thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. Uh, so, go right ahead. Open and the return on your investment and Penn National's investment will begin. Can you give us some specifics on what your strategy is going to be on keeping some of those profits back in the community in the form of philanthropy? Um, I, I know you may or may not have that strategy outlined yet at this date, but what, in your experience with Penn National in other markets where they're operating casinos, what has been their policy? And I'm not speaking about the, um, the, uh, the 2 percent that you referred to earlier that you've agreed with the commission to give for services, but other nonprofit missions that are here in central Ohio. Great question. Um, let me first start by saying that um, outside of the 2 percent, um, I, I did want to ask Madam Chair today that the best philanthropy effort we can have today in this room is to have Madam Chair relax the regulation for one day and I can hand out the jackpot combination code to everyone here in this room. Okay. <laughs> uh, on a serious note though, when it comes to philanthropy, what you will find, and, and I've said this repeatedly at all of my public speaking engagements in the last five months, let our actions speak louder than words. When it comes to the strategy, what you'll find Penn National is a company that is not centrally driven by corporate. They don't say, they don't dictate who to, to partner with in charitable programs. If you look at our decision this morning in partnering with colleges, it wasn't a top-down decision. They assign management teams at local jurisdictions, and those management teams specifically decide who they partner with in charitable efforts, in public institutions, in private institutions, how we'll become a uh, community partner, which communities we support, why we support that, that strategy then we submit to our corporate folks who then play a very key supportive role, but that's not dictated centrally. So we would be planning to do that completely driven here locally. We would be having our own charitable committee right here at the property, prioritizing our funds here and designating them to local charities. And I've had multitude number of meetings so far, starting with Westside Community Charitable Programs. I've uh, appeared at the community uh, events. I've uh, also uh, talked to Human Services Chamber, Goodwill. I've uh, talked with uh, partnering with uh, the Central Ohio United Way chapter, and all those entities will be supported uh, very quickly here. Thank you. Next question. My name is Daniel Hutchison. I'm the director of Ohio Combat Veterans. Uh, we help our returning veterans transition when they come home from Iraq and Afghanistan. My question with you uh, would be with the jobs that are coming up. Do you have a plan in place to hire Ohio's returning veterans? Absolutely. In fact, we've had multiple requests, starting with uh, the Columbus Chamber, uh, also with our partnership that we announced this morning with uh, Central Ohio Workforce Investment Corporation. Uh, there's about three or four sources already that have approached us directly to, to initiate a very specific program to make sure that we are including everyone in that process. Yes. Thank you. Next question. My name is Al Gobble, and I'm a uh, emeritus professor at Ohio State and a leader of the equine racing and breeding industry. We had, just briefly, a billion dollar industry, not counting ripple effect, and it's gone because of unfair competition for rounding states. And this question is for Jennifer Bruner, who's not here. Oh, I was going to say, well. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask her. Uh, to enumerate the 19 points that she said in the petition which were misstatements or absolute untruths. But it passed just that way. She got outvoted four to one. And the other question is, how much did the entrepreneurs of the industry pay to get this passed and, and uh, ads and so forth? Let me uh, take a first crack at answering uh, those questions. As, as far as what is, is being helpful to, to the breeding uh, and s industry and to the racetracks, there's, there is a sum of 3% that is set aside as they're setting aside 
percentages for problem gaming, they are setting aside 3% of, of the tax, actually, that will go to the racetracks. That will be for breeding, it, it will be for purses, and it will be for other operations. There's, there's a little glitch in that a little bit that basically says that if one of the tracks is, has a majority ownership by one of the casino operators, they do not share in the distribution of those dollars. But Ohio is well on its way also to putting video lottery terminals into the racetracks, which I think the, that most of the operators there and the, and the breeders and the horsemen have been wanting to happen because they believe that that will generate some additional revenue to help the industry, which Ohio used to be very much a headquarters of breeding, and it has certainly declined in the state, but I think there's hoping that it would be rebuilt. Uh, I don't know the exact amount of money that was spent to pass this issue. I'm sure that there are reports that are available, but it was a significant amount of money invested in passing an issue um, this time around, and they were successful in doing that. So, uh, and there was not any, what I would consider to be organized opposition to it. Uh, let me- I'm very aware of what the law is, and there are four of the tracks that have, that are owned by uh, the companies that are all or part owners of the uh, of, of the casinos, and here we almost had VLTs at the end of the Strickland uh, administration, and now we've wasted a year and do not have them. And as a result, they're going to open the casinos before we can ever get VLTs. So they will train the people who are suckered enough to bet to go to the casinos rather than the horse tracks. After I got caught in the first buyout of 89, I trained and drove harness horses for 12 years. My family bred horses since 65. I'm past president of the horseman's organization, so I'm pretty familiar with what happened. I've been living okay, this. Okay, I, I think we get the, the general thrust of what you're, what you're saying here. You, you, want a piece, you want your industry to have a piece of the action here. Uh, and, and we get that, and I, and I understand, I mean, we are moving ahead with a plan to get VLTs at the racetracks. Now, Scioto Downs is owned by a West Virginia company. It plans to get those slot machines. It's here in Franklin County. Your casino is in Franklin County. Do you think that, cas that uh, racetrack is going to take money out of your pocket? Anytime we analyze market bill, it's a pie and that pie then gets divided, whether it's in the form of VLTs or a slot machine at a casino, that becomes the market demographics and people will have option to go to either one of these tracks or the casino. So yes, we would be looking at it in the same way. And, and Bill, I think if you look back at the estimate that was done initially on revenues that would go to the cities and the counties and the school districts, there were two revenue estimates. One was made without VLTs and one was made with VLTs. Uh, if you do the math, it makes about probably 25, 30% difference in, if you're looking at the revenue. Next question. This is to uh, Amit Patel. Amit, how are you doing? Very good, thank nice you. Nice to see you nice again. Nice to see you too. You know, I uh, want to thank you for bringing the jobs to Columbus. We appreciate the positive economic impact of these jobs. But all, we, you and I have had these discussions uh, previous for the players. How's the status of the $5 craps table? And is there going to be a cigar smoking lounge? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I think I had answered your question, the first part of your question, about two months ago. And uh, we will have $5 blackjack tables and craps tables, too, particularly. Uh, when it comes to the cigars, unfortunately, you'll have to go outside the building. Uh, so I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> And don't you have a, is there some kind of rule you have on your own employees about smoking? That's correct. Uh, we've taken a very unprecedented route here, very unique for the casino industry, that while the customers would not be allowed to smoke, uh, we made a decision to hire non-smokers only, and all of our prospective applicants will be going through uh, pre-screening criteria of not just drug tests, but also nicotine tests as well. Next Good question. afternoon. I'm Robert Shenton, CPA with Plant Moran, and I'm curious about some of the financial projections. Knowing that we have a number of commitments that have been made from the tax dollars with the arena deal and so forth, how confident are we in the revenue projections? Did we feel they're conservative, aggressive? How do we, how do we feel about those financial models? 
The, the revenue projections that we have, and I think that you see quoted every place, actually were done in maybe the middle of the summer of 2009 by the Ohio Department of Taxation. Uh, and those revenue numbers reflect both with and without VLTs. There's not been, to my knowledge, an updating of those revenue estimates. And so it's going to be a factor when they decide that they want to do a revenue projection update. There are obviously some things that are changed. The casinos are permitted to do 5,000 slots in each of their operations. They're not going to open up with 5,000 slots in their operations. But also remember that projection was done two years, not quite two and a half years ago. So I think that everybody is, seems to be, though, pretty optimistic that those projections will hold. If I can add to that, um, the, the commission study that specifically addressed the revenue projections, it was in 2009, post-referendum. And that was very specifically projecting anywhere in the neighborhood of uh, 340 some million dollars in tax revenues with all four operations coming into place. Uh, without the VLTs. Uh, we, two, year, two years or two and a half years later, are, are feeling very optimistic that we'll be able to meet those numbers. Uh, hi, my name's Andy Campbell. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Patel. Uh, just curious if you have an idea of the makeup of your patronage. How many would be coming from a local area and how many might be coming from, from further outside of the central Ohio area? And then how far or how wide a net do you cast in regards to marketing and promotion to attract people from outside? Great. Um, typically, our market demographics, the most convenience market that we look at, uh, will span anywhere from, say, 60 to 90 miles out. You know, if you've seen what has happened so far in the last 10 years, all of our neighboring states, almost all of our neighboring states have had some sort of gambling expansion uh, bills that have promoted different forms of gambling. Uh, when you open four casinos strategically located distance from each other, I think you are going to bring Ohioans back to Ohio. You are going to have the spending pattern put back into the communities where we operate. Uh, specifically, what you'll also see, Andy, in, and we've seen this time and time again in other jurisdictions, as the city develops its marketing plan, as we bring more businesses, convention, group sales, uh, travel, summer tourism, all of those people, whether they're coming from California or Texas, significant portion of our customer database then ends up coming to the casino as well because then ultimately we're marketing this casino as one of many amenities to offer in the city of Columbus and all of the partnerships that we have with the chamber, with Experience Columbus, all of the entities that support and promote the city, we all end up not only investing together but reaping the benefits together as well. Especially uh, under Governor John Kasich, I think it's fair to say that we are getting a message that uh, government bodies need to uh, make sure they're not overburdening business because that destroys jobs. Ms. Davidson, I wondered, though, from your point of view, does, does that come into your mind as your role, uh, or is that too much of a booster role in terms of what you think? I mean, are you a regulator or a booster, or are you both? I think we probably fit into the category of being both, but the fundamental thing we are is a regulator, and the fundamental responsibility we're given under the, the state law, frankly, is to be sure that they are operated appropriately and legally and fair to both, uh, obviously, to the state of Ohio and its political subdivisions, but fair to the people that are actually going to be uh, the patrons of these casinos. However, we certainly have not gone around the country and looked at other regulations and said, let's find the, the toughest ones that we have out there, so we'll do that to initially begin with. What we've tried to do is realistically look at what other states are doing and, and take a combination of those things that we believe actually fit into what Ohio is a unique state, fit Ohio and what is our responsibility and bring the best practices into the rules that we're adopting. Another question. I'm Kathy Fox, past president of the Metropolitan Club. Uh, Mr. Patel, you spoke earlier about um, sort of at a high level about your work to engage businesses in the neighborhood around the uh, casino. And traditionally, these kinds of um, facilities are very big and, and often self-contained where once a patron enters, they can find 
pretty much what they need there. What specifically are you doing to um, engage businesses in the, on the west side so that there will be some economic benefit to that area? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, um, we, have to, we are partnering already uh, on an ongoing basis with Western Vision. And if you see the charter of what Western Vision is trying to do in the community, it's beyond just private businesses, public businesses, charitables. We have very specifically discussed the investment that needs to occur outside of the perimeters of the 120 acres where this property sits. We're looking at everything from attracting different businesses, amenities that complement the casino, retail, hotel, a beautification of the Broad Street and Georgesville area. We're looking at very specific program as to how we not only just clean up the main street, have better traffic patterns, have a very pretty site for all of the millions of visitors that come to this site so that they can go outside of the casino parameters beyond the amenities that we provide and then start establishing other businesses, whether they attract tourists or even office space or particularly the hotel space or the retail space that is very, very common in many jurisdictions where we operate. Mr. Patel, you, you've been a general manager of other casinos run by Penn National in, in other cities. How would you compare uh, the welcome and the, the business atmosphere here uh, in Ohio and Columbus to, to elsewhere? Extremely unique uh, is the best way I can come up with. I, I talked yesterday that when I say extremely unique, I need to emphasize I was sitting 1,000 miles away a year ago reading the newspaper headlines. And when I landed here in August, uh, and I mentioned this also to even Madam Chair, that the welcome that I've had, not only from the business community, from people who are willing to work with us, partner with us, and wanting to make sure this project gets started and up and running has been particularly overwhelming. On a personal level, I've never had Never, and I moved to Midwest, I have moved to the Bahamas outside the country, and I moved to East Coast. I've never had a community where we live where all of our neighbors showed up in the first five days with baskets, fruits, identities, and their favorite places to eat, where they shop. It is unheard of, and we were deeply moved. I know my wife, Krushi here, will support the same notion. It's something that we never expected. It has been unusually friendly, welcome, and warm community on the business side and on the personal side as well. I think we have time for at least one more question. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Megan Novi. I am a student at Ohio State University, and this question is for both of our panelists. Um, are you concerned, or do you have a plan for the types of illegal activities that might not happen inside of a casino, but perhaps surround the casino culture? Obviously, the areas outside of the casino will be under the jurisdiction of the local law enforcement um, entities, but what we are doing is working very closely with them. We initially had a study done on law enforcement and what we needed to do and included as we visited around the state, visiting with the chiefs of police, with the prosecuting attorneys, with the sheriff, So, and we are continuing that uh, by our director of enforcement. Uh, now renewing those efforts. So we'll work very closely in the four communities with the entire law enforcement community. We will have responsibility inside the casino. They will have responsibility outside of the casino, but, they're, but they will also have some, obviously, enforcement or, or jurisdiction uh, on any arrests that are made inside the casino. So we will need and want and will encourage a very good working relationship with them and have already laid the foundation for that now. Mr. Patel, what's your yeah. view on, on that, that criminal uh, question there? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's along the same lines. We have uh, an obligation here to make sure that not only our perimeters are safe, but also all of the surrounding areas are very safe, secure, well-lit, 24-7 comes with a huge amount of responsibility, and we don't take that lightly. What we are equipped with is unprecedented levels of surveillance systems working very closely with the local law enforcement agencies. We've been in many situations where we've assisted local law enforcement in catching criminals, 
that surround the property or even are passing by uh, from our surveillance system to our security systems and having an ongoing dialogue and communication of presence of each other together, uh, I feel pretty confident that we'll do a very, very good job on that front. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? I want to uh, thank all of you for, for joining us today. I know we all feel uh, uh, pretty fortunate to have such competent people on both sides of this equation. Uh, thank you. I uh, want to thank our sponsors once again, E.P. Uh, Ferris and Smoot Construction. We'll continue the conversation. I'm sure there'll be a few press people to talk about your program. Waiting for you out in the lobby, Mr. Patel. Uh, want to again thank uh, Mr. Patel, Speaker Davidson, uh, for your participation today. Welcome to town, Mrs. Patel. And I'm glad you're feeling welcome. Uh, and Bill, as always, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being here. Come back next week for a little politics. Thank you. Thank you.